there is a man who lives in the north. He lives in Laos. An American pilot found out where he was and told Lair. The largest helicopter anybody had ever seen, 50 feet long. And so they met. Lair was very tactful. He asked a question, what are you going to do? And Vang Pao launched in a soliloquy. Vang Pao not only wanted to protect his own country, not only wanted to help his people, but he was ambitious himself. It was extremely important for Lair, who was a very subtle operative, to find out what the other side had wanted. He wanted it to come from Vang Pao. He would have the Hmong as the tactical field commander, the guy who would call the shots in the field. The supporters would be the Thais and the Americans. And he and Lair remembered it almost exactly the same word for word 50 years later. These are our hills. These are our mountains. However, the enemy has come. If you give us arms, we will fight them. If not, we will flee. Northern Laos has been home to the Hmong for two centuries by this time. And all of them believe that that's their homeland, that's their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, their ancestors had lived there, harvest that land, died there, buried there, and they feel that's their home and they needed to retake. By this time, the CIA's very interest is to deter communist aggression in Southeast Asia. Berlair was sent to Southeast Asia specifically to fight guerrilla warfare by the CIA. And he went in and he got the trust from the Thai and he incorporated the Paru program, training the, the, these men into special forces. It was Lair's original plan not to have any white Americans at all. He wanted the Paru to work with VP. They just blended right in. Nobody could tell that they were there. They became the instructors and the advisors. Desmond Fitzgerald sent an 18-page cable back to Washington to the CIA headquarters. And shortly after that, it got approved to arm 1,000 men. And that's how Operation Momentum came about. The Americans had all these surplus arms. They were surplus from World War II. They were already in crates. The Patet Lao communists saw those first supply parachutes dropping and came in and they conducted a three-day training program for the Hmong to harass and intercept Conley's troops and the Commons troops. The Hmong were set up for ambushes. The Paru were there, but the Paru were not holding weapons themselves. They were advising. They wanted the Hmong to do the shooting from the very start. They wanted Vang Pao completely in charge from the very start. The ambush went off without a hitch. They killed all the enemy soldiers. There was a lot of rejoicing. There were Hmong who jumped for joy. There were Hmong who were not involved in the fighting, who pleaded for a rifle. And Lair arrived in a small plane in the midst of all this rejoicing. And that's how the secret army started. Vang Pao asserted that he could raise a guerrilla force of 10,000 tribesmen. The CIA said, okay, start small. The Hmong already had 12 resistance centers set up around the Plain of Jars. This came from previous stages of war they'd had with the French, so the Hmong were really, really prepared. So it went from the first thousand in about a month, and then 4,000, 6,000, up till 10,000, and then quickly mushroom past that. Vang Pao was ambitious. He was a man of great ability. He did not want to be a guerrilla commander. He wanted airplanes, he wanted artillery, he wanted tanks, he wanted to fight a conventional war. Once 
Vang Pao got a hold of conventional weapons and air power, he would want to fight the Vietnamese head on, the most capable army in all of Asia at that time. The Hmong in Laos at that point had only 250,000 and the North Vietnamese had 19 million. So Lair always wanted it to be a guerrilla war and Vang Pao always wanted to go big. The more the Americans spent, the less successful the war effort was. A decision was made to place a radar apparatus on a mountaintop called Pupati that could be used for helping American warplanes navigate even through cloudy, rainy weather to Hanoi to drop the bombs that were supposed to win the war. North Vietnam feels the threat, feels the pain, and they send in a large number of troops into Laos to take this site out. At the same time, south of Pupati was Naka, Site 36. The United States utilized Site 36 as a rescue base to rescue down American pilots. The Hmong played a significant role for that. It was very obvious from the reconnaissance planes that the North Vietnamese were determined to reach this mountain and to capture the mountain peak. Rather than serve as a strategic advantage to the U.S. side to have that facility on the mountain top, it turned inside out. It, it turned into a target. At the beginning of the war, it was very simple. The Hmong were protecting their own lands. To protect somebody else's lands involves a layer of an abstraction that many were not quite ready for. The war was like a, a kaleidoscope where the, the, the tubes were twisted and, and the picture changed completely. People in Washington started thinking that instead of the Hmong having an operation to defend their own territory, they really should help out the operation in South Vietnam. To different people, the war was about different things. It would endanger the security of all and the peace of all of Southeast Asia. To the proponents of the war, it was about stopping the march of communism across the Southeast Asia. There was something called the domino theory. All we want in Laos is peace, a truly neutral government, not a Cold War pawn. The opponents of the war saw it as the U.S. meddling in what was essentially a civil war in that region. There are no American combat forces in Laos. There were stories about the secret war in Laos, but not a lot of coverage. The main show was in Vietnam. There was a lot of fighting, there was a lot of running, there was a lot of shooting, and there was a lot of dying. And I never learned the name of more than one or two airplane pilots because they had quite a high mortality rate. We had two groups that we flew in, primarily Air America, and the other was uh, known as Continental Airlines, and they worked for the boys next door. We delivered rice for the two years that I worked with Pop, helping people go to a new area and uh, get started in a new life. There was quite a lot of attrition among the Hmong soldiers. It got so bad that at one time, General Vang Pao had to send out the order that all students, male, up to the age of 11, were exempt from going in the army. But if you were 11 years old, you were drafted, and you ended up in the Hmong army. I went out to the airstrip one day and saw a group of soldiers around a body. It was a very small body. I talked to a little boy next to it. He was 12 years old, and he was dressed in a uniform that was about three times too big. He was Hmong, but he knew Lao. And he said, that is my friend, Li Gao. He and I both joined the army a year ago when he was 10 and I was 11 and he was killed this week, and I am flying back with his body to the village that he came with. His rifle accompanied him, a small carbine suitable for that of a boy. The larger rifles went to uh, taller, more grown-up men. But 
a helicopter or a plane picked up the body and they picked up the gun, flew them back to the village. He was buried and his carbine was then handed to the next boy that took his place in the Hmong army. At school next to the airport, one of my friends, her name's Julie, so we were just grabbed into the airplane, you know, away from the family to the to a nurse training. Why am I doing this and no other? You know, why other girls they can be with the parent but not me? You know, until you see the all the wounded soldier, until you see all the sick patient, until you see all these patients who are critical in an ICU, you will be taught that you have to help your people and you should not be scared and you will be with other nurses too and they will be there for you. It doesn't matter how old or how young you are. They will treat all the nurses at the same level and they will make sure that you you treat just like everyone else over there. The war time, the man, oh, the planning more. ทุลุยาจอตัวมุจอปุ้งปิปุ้งจอตัวหน้าห้องหมอเจยูฮายูจอเอ่อฮาวสคิปปิ้งจอตัวเนี่ยจอจิเน่งเลยนะเอ่อ
tu tu po leng ya to nyong so tu ba to lum bom la je ku ai te keng ta le ku chi wu zeng te shi lu man he i tu ta han lao nu po te lu ku ha na tu de na khan na lu nyo mu nyo ba to ni na ni na je ne ya to ne ta han lao ho a na ne tu tu yo pe jo to chong plo jo chong nyo nyong te ne wu yi ma to to tro lum bom a capacity de a lu thong thang tra ma cho to pe so mong la peso mon ngo ngo so ya lin da ma mu chi tu a ma ya chu su ke ngo ya a lu e si pa cha mu i lu i ro ta si pe cha mong ma ni wa yu ni xia che mon mo le te che ya ni ku ni ti ya ko tu ye la mu to mu i ro ku ma hai mo hai zo ku ya mong e ku chi lai ngan zhe lu hai te ka ku lai ngan e yi mo cha ta ta ti si ya pi lo lu li no ku i bo bu shen ya ta han ku lu ku lu te che ku lu ku pe shen wo กูปอนี่ล่ะจงเลยกูมั่วซูเปอร์เรียลส่งตู้กูจะจุดตัวซะซูโอ้จ้าเนี่ยฮะรู้เลยได้จ้ามันเด็กกูจะมั่วจีเ
they just put on civilian clothes because like the Peru that they could blend right in the northern Vietnamese could also just blend right in so for the Westerners they couldn't tell but for those in Laos particularly for Vang Pao and the Mong they knew who the Vietnamese are because they've been fighting the Vietnamese since the 1950s there was no question that North Vietnam could have sent in large numbers of its own forces and taken over Vien Chan if they had wanted it enough. However, this was to cause them to hesitate and to make them aware that they would have to fight through the Hmong to do so. ก็ญาติเจเตจีถูเอ่อนึกว่าจอว่าจอนเลยจีญาลาสู้ตัวจอจีญาลามั่วก็กลัวหมู่ตัวซ้ายต่อญาลาเลยจีก็จะรีจะ
เจนในพลตัวตุงยูย้อนรายเอาจิงไก่เนาะโอปิกนิกพักล็อกนั่นแหละมันเนาะเจแล้วจึงตัวยูเจไผ่ยูอัวอู้อัวเนาะจึงจ
why is the general leaving and the high-ranking officers are leaving when we were the soldiers that fought in the war? People were angry that he didn't come out and say, this is what we will do, we will all go together, we will all stand together. There were people getting angry at each other, pointing guns at each other, saying, my family goes first, you stay here, you're nobody. I'm ranking officer, I go first. Anger, fear, and a lot of guns. So it was a very difficult situation. Jerry was the one who remained cool, calm, and collected, and uh, it was his job to come up with a plan as to how to safely get the general out. If we count down the number of high-ranking officers and their families, how many do we think would be on that list? When the American planes came, chaos broke out at the airport. Uh, now people knew this was an escape situation. It was no longer people following the lists. Now it was a free-for-all, and everybody was running for the planes. Many people who were at Longcheng at the time say that it was their feeling that the general kind of drug his feet on leaving because the more planes that came in to take out his top officers, their family, a lot of other soldiers, it gave them more time to escape. You go in with a 130 to land, but nobody has ever taken off out of there fully loaded. They were actually clearing those mountains barely. Part of the escape plan that Jerry and the general had put together was that they needed some kind of a diversion, some kind of a cover. And the plan was for the C-130 to land. As the C-130 boosts its engine to take off, both the jet ranger and the porter were to take off. And for Wing Pao's bodyguards to get onto the porter beforehand. The porter took off, circled around, looking down, observing the evacuation. The jet ranger went down the ramp, came low around the king's house, and landed behind the king's house. Wing Pao took his jeep and drove up to the king's house. They got onto the helicopter. And so the C-130 was on the ground. We've got a C-130 here on final. Go Landing ahead. lights just came on. This could be the last bird. Everybody was focused on running to the back end of that C-130. Nobody else knew that once the general was gone, the air evacuation was going to end. It took one hour and 20 minutes to make the trip. We're not sure that the other is going to by chance, one of the American C-46s, the radios had gone out, and so he didn't hear the message that the general was gone, abort, abort, the evacuation is over. So he went in. Okay, the aircraft is filled now, but the people won't leave the uh, rear of it. Many of the people said that they could barely breathe because of the pressure of the people that were standing all around them. Mattis uh, revved up the engines and pulled ahead a little bit, and the blast has sort of discouraged some of them. They're starting to move away a little bit. They also said it was so noisy, so chaotic, with the engines and people talking, yelling to their family members that were still outside, trying to find their kids. But once that airplane took off, it was dead silence. He was the last plane, but he was so mobbed that the, the plane was only about half full when he took off and learned that that was it. The evacuation was over. 10,000 people standing on the runway, looking up at the sky, waiting for the next plane to come, and it never did. Got a 
ในพนักปอจ้าเนี่ยเขาตุ่นต่อเขียตัวจ้องเลยนึกว่าย่อใจกูจีเยอีตุ่นนอกกูจีเขียจิตต์อก็ยังไม่จะไม่จอนเย่จอบปอเจตก็ไอ้ก็เขียก็ตัวซื้อก็จีจีเนาะอีตุ่นนอกยังกูมากูเขียแล้วกูจีอีตุ่นนอกมองเนี่ยกูจีมันเขียจิตต์มองตัวนะมองตัวมองย้อนนะมองย้อนอีปัจจัยเส้นลุ่นตู่ปุ๊บจะเสียดายย้อนตานุตือย้อนนุ่นตาเราเดี๋ยวเราเราเตะเขียวตู่เลยจิ้มมาจ่อจ่อเลยย้อนก็ย้อนก็เจอก็ย้อนตัวจ่อก็จิ้มมาจ่อก็ย้อนย้อนยงตัวลวงมุสโอเตซึ่งก็ประกาศ Very quickly the seminar system develops which is basically a reeducation camp the government starts with the officers first working down through the ranks and those that are the higher officers are sent off to very very remote areas some new of yang sai and put into basically prison camp but we were born into being jiao fa trying to escape into thailand um, but i always thought that the jiao fa was the common theme for me was that they were resistant. They were for the Hmong nationalism, Hmong identity, Hmong sovereignty, and they were there to fight so that Hmong people could exist. For the Hmong resistance that continued to build at Pubia, there were two main leaders. One was Sai Shu Yang, and the other was Zhong Zhu He. Uh, but Sai Shu's group tended to work more closely with the former soldiers and the former officers that had removed themselves to the Pubia area. They counted on radios. They hid their guns. They tried to communicate with Thailand to find out: Is there a plan? Is somebody coming to help us? Is there some way for us to get out of here? On the other hand, Zhong Zhuo was more interested in uh, more like an independent Hmong state. His group relied more on supernatural forces to protect themselves. When the Pathet Lao heard that, uh, they thought it was. Very humorous, sky god or god from the sky, and so they started using the term Chafa for everybody. The Pubia base is losing, and people are making their way towards Thailand. The same thing is happening with Van Kai Vu's group at Puma Tao. They're all following these mountain tops. <laughs> Soon as each refugee group moved to a province, within two three months, you will see this whole side of mountain or hill fill up with grave. You know, with little kid, a lot of kid that die more than the adult. Is there help? Is anybody going to come? Some of the messages said, "Hang on a little longer, and we will send help." But hang on, hold that territory. Other messages said, "Nobody is coming. Nothing is coming. The U.S. is gone. General Vong Pao is now in the United States. Get out of there. Come." Jerry Daniels is one of the people who's saying, "Come out, come out." Even though he was absolutely clear that the U.S. government was not coming back, was not going to re-engage, he still was a protector of a certain kind for the Hmong that were in the refugee camps. Jerry basically went native. He spoke the local language. He lived with them, and he's like a brother to them. He just developed a very, very close relationship. They could trust him, and he trusted them. He has worked with the Lao operation for so long that it was really hard for him to let it go. American Embassy, Bangkok, Thailand, May 14, 1982. Asphyxiation due to inhalation of carbon monoxide, according to. Ultimately, there was a casket that was sent back that was sealed. That the U.S. government said this casket is never to be opened, and so for the Hmong there was never any closure. You know how he started his letters off, don't you, animal man? No. Well, you just dribbling <laughs> kid. Where the <laughs> are you now? <laughs> <laughs>
the Hmong probably had the closest relationship with the U.S. government of any other, uh, or more so than any other ethnic group, uh, uh, whether in Vietnam, in Cambodia, or in, in Laos. Uh, the Hmong now are, as a group, are in difficult situations because of this. They're the only group that the, uh, the Vietnamese have pretty well singled out for anti-Hmong operations. <laughs> It became clear very early that the officials in Laos regarded the Hmong as threats, and there is evidence of severe sustained attacks, uh, artillery and troops, reports of chemicals of some sort, poison chemicals being used against the Hmong. Those refugees that I've spoken with describe having lived in, in fear of their lives uh, and living in the jungle for months and years and making an arduous trek which lasts weeks or more to get to the Mekong River and cross to Thailand. The secret war engaging people from Mien, Kaimu, Lua, and Hmong hill tribes was designed to tie down as many North Vietnamese troops as possible keeping them from moving along the Ho Chi Minh Trail to South Vietnam. Hmong casualties ran to the tens of thousands, ten times those faced proportionately by American soldiers in Vietnam. There is a startling absence of men and boys of fighting age among the surviving Hmong population. <laughs> From the very beginning, it was this partnership. We'll give you weapons. You fight for your own land, your own independence, your own freedom. It's been that way all along. It was, you know, hardware, software, and Hmong got eaten up. Our desire, even from the days of China, has always been justice and liberty and, and the right to exist in this world. And because of these two motivation and desire, their force of energy that drew them together and their, their friendship was not through some sort of doctrine or agreement, but it was in the battlefield. That's tremendous courage, tremendous sacrifice and loyalty, not to the American necessary, but to the cause of freedom, liberty, and justice. Yes, the CIA created this. But the personality, the, the uh, stubbornness of Hmong, their drive for independence, their drive for freedom, is part of what tripped them up. They didn't just roll over like the lowland Lao. There are some families who've suffered so much, who lost, who lost so many relatives trying to cross the Mekong River that they will never recover from that grief. There are many other families who say to themselves, would I return to Laos now even though I miss the old traditional culture? No way, no way at all. Even now, everything's still very fresh in your eye, in your mind, in your heart that you're not gonna forget it. The whole family are broken. Husband left wife, Wife and children, wife and children left husband, son and daughter left parent, parent left the kids. So we can, we never connect. 
I don't remember how she looked like, but what happened to my mind, I always, her image always had me. I always think about her that what happened to her. Do Back then in nothing. No psychology doctor, no psychiatric doctor, nobody evaluate people after the war. Then I never saw her anymore after that. And I keep asking my dad what happened to her. We knew that no, no, she more not to the high idea. Who bought your mother, who a patch it on the patch talk to Kenny. Yardy Jay, who did you know? No, they put your under the cut to the bunny along. My mom has sent him um, the cassette that he which recorded over and then sent it back to her. It's a very intimate communication uh, between them and in the audio cassette, my father explained his aspiration and his desire, his determination and motivation to go back into Laos uh, to do the work of uh, our father, General Wang Pao. And uh, you know, I didn't know about the audio cassette about until I was in my 20s. And when I heard it, I remember crying. I remember I just couldn't hold it the tears back and there was just so much emotion that uh, was going through me because for a long time I thought that uh, somehow I had something to do with my father leaving I, I wasn't good enough for something like that and had I known that uh, he was going to Laos uh, go and join the Jaffa or the resistance I wouldn't have done everything I could to stop him. But as a kid, I was about 10, 11, um, maybe a little bit older than that. Uh, I, I just couldn't stop him. I mean, I didn't know anything about it. And for a long time, I just carried that guilt that I wasn't good enough like other kids, other sons. That's my, why my father went and chose to uh, uh, join the resistance. Tashi 
Rồi xin cho mà cái chả là của sách thảo và các bạn trong hệ đó của cho mình nhiều Ai cả số, ai cả mà nó lên nó là chỉ lúc cả là xí ở lên nó Chuyện đấy ưu ở xin chí ở ưu ở xin lúc Ai cũng mà lúc cả Thảo tư ở ưu xin chí là Gia cũng chí cả Cú tổ mần chí cả Làm chí này cho nên tu mà Nư Dạ lý lúc chí chá và chóa ká chí hợp bê lúc khó khó Xin nơi cả nên nó Hãy giờ thì các làn chi cũ, ai cũ tạo cả, ai cũ mua bồi sửa đời bảo thì cũ, cũ là chơi xong là các đời bảo thì cũ chơi xong, các làn chi cũ mà cũ xài hết tiền chơi cái gì cơ kia, chơi điện nó cho lên cho tụ tụ la tụ yêu làn chơi, yêu anh chị các mình chơi yêu dùng cơ kia, chỉ đơn này phần ba ba mình chơi nữa lúc cái cơ kia cũ xa xứ, tại vì cũ xin chơi sẽ bắt đầu khăn nó. ยากุนเทียจิตเตาคันนะเจกุตะกาตัวจอนในจันเนี่ยตู้ซื้อซื้อจิตเตาหลอบริจานี้อยู่ฉันรู้ตัวนี้ก็เนี่ย Sometimes I've been told no one has ever asked me my story. No one's ever asked what happened to me. And so there's this sense of confirmation that they've actually shared their story with someone. A good number of times when I've been interviewing the dad, the soldier, the children will come to sit on the floor around, very quietly sit on the floor and listen to this. And you can see him transforming as he finally becomes a full person in their eyes. They tell me, oh, my dad never told me that story before, but he says I've told them many times they've never listened. I thought that I was going to be a kid. 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 ก็มั่วล่ะผู้กูนอกกูมั่วล่ะผู้กันนอกเอ็มมุ่งเที่ยวมุ่งเกี่ยวชิลุอย่าชิ้นจึงเชี่ยเนี่ยโยชาจะชิ้นจึงเชี่ยการเชี่ยนั่นเนี่ยน้ำมุ่งชัวก็ชิ้นใหญ่ชิ้นโตเกี่ยมเองโตกี่ตัวงูตัวมาตั้งแต่อึดอัดทุ่นชิ้นโตนั้นชิ้นเชี่ยวหัวล่ะยิ่งตัวหัวเช็คกันชิ้นลุยตัวอันนี้ตัวตัวที่เกี่ยยิ่งโตเรียน rong li cũ tê tròn xa nó, giá to là cũ rong xiết to là hết tiệt, rồi nó trở chua cũ từng bao xua là. Production funding for the Hmong and the Secret War is provided by... Wells Fargo is proud to support this important documentary, The Hmong and the Secret War. As a first-generation Hmong American, I am honored to represent a company that celebrates and embraces America's rich diversity. Watch out.
The Fresno County Superintendent of Schools is proud to be a longtime supporter of the quality educational programs found on Valley PBS. We continue to work together to honor and enhance understanding of the rich tapestry of cultures and communities found in our region. Established in 1946, the Clovis Veterans Memorial District honors our Valley heroes, dedicated to the memory of all who proudly served, continue to serve, and protect the country. The district provides a permanent living memorial to the United States military and veterans. Additional production funding provided by and by viewers like you. Thank you.